for over 100 years, dentists have been debating and discussing the impact of oral breathing on the craniofacial development of children. This paper here was published in 1909. And when we look at the traits caused by oral breathing, the chin recedes, the roof of the mouth is high, in other words, the child has a high narrow palate, the dental arches are contracted, and the teeth are crooked. There's dryness of the mouth and the throat caused by mouth breathing. It's often accompanied by headache. The child has a restless sleep. The bones of the face are underdeveloped. The face looks dull and expressionless. And teachers will accuse children of being unattentive at the school. These same traits are the exact traits that we are seeing 100 years later. But there has been no improvement to awareness in terms of you know, recognizing the impact that children who are mouth breathing and the effect that that is having on their dental health, their development of their face, the development of their arches, and more importantly, the development of their airway. I go to my dentist here in my Cullen. He was educated at Trinity College in Dublin. And a couple of years ago, I brought up the topic of mouth breathing in children. And he said there wasn't a connection. As a lay person looking in, I have been reading this material for 10 years and there's a huge weight of evidence now suggesting the link between oral breathing and abnormal craniofacial development. Yes, one could argue that it may be that the child is born with a narrow maxilla, the palate is very high and as a result this is causing mouth breathing or it could be argued that mouth breathing is resulting in low resting tongue posture and undeveloped maxilla. But either way, it doesn't matter. There is probably a feedback loop here, but more importantly is that dentists are in a wonderful position to do something about it. Dentists are the gatekeeper to the airway. They're looking into children's mouths. They're seeing the development of the child in front of them. And really we need to be addressing this in terms of sleep as a preventative approach. Children who developed adequate airways will ensure that they have good sleep for the rest of their life. These children in school who are open mouth breathing, and we know it's up to 50% of studied children, teachers aren't aware of the importance of nasal breathing. Doctors are generally not encouraging and advising their pediatric patients to breathe through their nose. Many dentists are not aware of the impact of oral breathing. Mouth breathing has been studied since the beginning of the 20th century. This paper is 1946, with scientific publications directed to the scope of dentistry, emphasizing the occlusal consequences. And we need to bear in mind that the growth of the face, 60% of the growth of the face, takes place in the first four years of life, and 90% takes place by the age of 12. The development of the lower jaw continues until around 18. In this paper, which is more recent, the maxilla undergoes its greatest postnatal growth during infancy and early childhood. Overall linear growth changes that occurred between six months of age and five years of age, a span of four and a half years, were generally greater than the changes in maxillary growth that occurred between five and 16 years, which is a span of 11 years. The window of opportunity is very, very brief. Early intervention and an acknowledgement and a recognition that dentists can positively impact these children's lives for the rest of their lives. Back to 1910, in the dental cosmos, it is either a very brave or a very ignorant man indeed who takes the responsibility of advising delay in the treatment of developing malocclusion in view of the possibilities in the expansion of deciduous arches. And well-known studies that were carried out by Dr. E.P. Harvold back in the 1970s. He studied groups of young rhesus monkeys. And he recognized that oral respiration associated with obstruction of the nasal airway is a common finding among patients seeking orthodontic treatment. To determine the relationship between mouth breathing and crooked teeth, he conducted a number of experiments by blocking the noses of young monkeys with silicon nose plugs. Published in the American Journal of Orthodontics in 1981, 
In quotes, the experiments showed that the monkeys adapted to nasal obstruction in different ways. In general, the experimental animals maintained an open mouth. All experimental animals gradually acquired a facial appearance and dental occlusion different from those of the control animals. He was able to replicate the same abnormal growth in the monkeys as we see in children. Parents often say to me when they hear of this study that they say it was gruesome, it was cruelty to animals. And I totally agree. But for 100 years we have debating this in children. Millions of children are partaking in this same study because our failing as healthcare professionals to encourage children to breathe through their nose and to adopt correct tongue resting posture. In Harvold's studies, the mouth breathing monkeys develop crooked teeth and other facial deformities, including a lowering of the chin, a steeper mandibular plane angle, and an increase in the gonial angle as compared with the eight control animals. And the debate rages on. This paper here is from Dr. Catherine Vig. And she writes that evidence from animal studies has been extrapolated to explain the human condition. But total nasal obstruction as produced by Harvold is extremely rare in human beings. The debate therefore should focus on whether partial nasal obstruction is a risk factor for altered dentofacial growth in children. Personally, Dr. Vig has missed the point here. It's not about total nasal obstruction. It's not about partial nasal obstruction. It is whether the nasal obstruction has been sufficient to cause mouth breathing. Any obstruction to the nose is going to replace nasal breathing by mouth breathing. Clinicians, according to Dr. Catherine Vig, need to quantify answers such as how much nasal obstruction is critically significant? At what age is the onset of nasal obstruction critical? How long does the obstruction of the nasal airway have to exist before a growth effect may be anticipated? And is this clinically relevant to orthodontics? I'm going to answer this in just one simple statement. No child should ever persistently breathe through an open mouth for any more than six months at a time. In actual fact, it could be argued no child should have their mouth open persistently for even a week. If they have a head cold, fine, they may have their mouth open for a little time. But after that, we need children to revert back to nasal breathing. Is this clinically relevant to orthodontics? I think it is well documented that mouth breathing children, because of incorrect resting tongue posture, that they do and it does lead to development of narrow arches. Jaws are set back. Orthodontics and dentistry, functional dentists, are the gateway to the airway. We need to help ensure that these children are breathing through their nose for good sleep, for good concentration, because the impact on their education, their behavior, their quality of life is carried through to the rest of their life. As a prerequisite, according to Dr. Catherine Vig, we need to reliably identify nasorespiratory function and quantify the degree of obstruction. Comparisons of persons matched for age and gender with and without nasal obstruction should provide the clinician with information of any clinically relevant differences in facial morphologic characteristics. I totally agree that yes, we need research in this field with a large sample population over a number of years. It could be easily done. We have hundreds of thousands of children who are persistently mouth breathing. It's about selecting a cohort of these children who are mouth breathing and to match them against children who are undergoing nasal breathing and also maxillary expansion. And to see what is the difference in the changes to these children's face as a result of breathing through the nose. This study could be easily arranged. Catherine Viggs, she points out that the results are often mixed in terms of tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. She quotes Linda Aronson, who reported in a group of children who had adenoidectomy, that when they returned to nasal breathing, they demonstrated significant craniofacial growth changes. On the other hand, she quotes Bushy, 
who found no relationship between nasal respiration and linear measurements of the adenoids. We have to ask the question here, where did children post-surgery taught to breathe through their nose? Because we know in practice that if a child has adenoid issues, that is going to cause mouth breathing and even when the adenoids are removed, the children will persistently breathe through an open mouth in most cases. We need breathing rehabilitation for these kids. And if not, we're not going to get the benefits of adenoidectomy in the first instance. So the researchers should be investigating that when they are looking at adenoidectomy in children, the real question to ask was, did these children switch to permanent nasal breathing both during wakefulness and during sleep with correct tongue resting posture? Because ultimately, it's about the resting posture of the tongue, the scaffolding in the roof of the mouth, which is helping to direct the growth of the jaws forward. Dr. Katrin Vague, clearly more objective tests are required. An ambiguous criteria must be established if airway impairment is to be adequately defined and its etiological significance in relation to facial growth determined. Only when this issue is resolved will the clinical impact of respiratory function be clarified and the appropriate interventions advocated. Dr. Katrin Vig wrote her paper back in 1998. Earlier on in the presentation, we looked at papers written back in 1909, 1910, 1946. We have to ask this question. Is there any harm in encouraging children to breathe through the nose? Children are visiting their dentist generally maybe twice a year. Dentists will be aware that mouth breathing children have increased dental cavities, dryness of the mouth, dryness of the throat and poorer oral health than their nasal breathing counterparts. So at the very least, we should be encouraging children and of course adults to breathe through their nose for dental health. Correct tongue resting posture is also a vital part when nasal breathing is restored. It is important to remember that as for many other therapeutic techniques, scientific proof is not available for every existing treatment. But this does not mean in the absence of scientific evidence, something is not valid. Otherwise, there would be no new treatments or any improvement in rehabilitative practice. Evidence-based medicine originated in the second half of the 19th century. It's based on four factors, individual clinical expertise, best external evidence, patient values and expectations. External clinical evidence can inform but can never replace individual clinical expertise. If you are a clinician looking into children's and adults' mouths for 10, 15, 20 years, you will amass a great deal of experience. It takes observation, it takes persistence, and it takes questioning. Our children and adults who are presenting at a dental surgery and they are persistently mouth breathing, are they doing less well than their nasal breathing counterparts? First, do no harm. Encourage nasal breathing. There are simple strategies, techniques, and the results are long-term.